Hi everyone, I'm Robbie Napoli, director of Luke's, and today I'm so glad to be here talking with composer and conductor Adrian Sims. Uh, Adrian is a student composer at the University of Maryland, and he's already doing some amazing things. Primarily, he's a composer of instrumental music. Uh, he's published with the FJH Music Company, and he's been performed at the Midwest Clinic and has been selected for the Band World Top 100 list. He's also won numerous awards and competitions, including the Maryland Music Educators Association's Young Composer Project and Make Music Young Composers Contest. And he's also worked with ensembles across the state of Maryland, rehearsing and performing his music. And as a performer, Adrian's a gifted trombonist who plays in a range of ensembles from wind ensembles to orchestras and pits and jazz bands. So Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to have you. Thanks for having me, Robbie. Absolutely. So what, what have you been up to uh, since the lockdown happened and, and everything's kind of changed? Well, you know, it's really, really interesting for, um, for composers because we really depend on ensembles to exist in order for us to write. So how, how do we go about that? It's really been challenging for me to, uh, to, to figure out what to do. But for, luckily for me, I mean, I know it's not been the same for a lot of composers, but my creative inspiration has just gone um, way, way up. And I've just been able to write a lot of things for a lot of different things. And I'm really fortunate to, uh, to have been able to, to just write a lot of stuff. And I've kind of gone into um, my introverted self and just kept writing and writing and writing. So that's, so it's really been not too bad overall. So a lot of good things have been happening writing wise. That's really great. I'm glad to hear that. I know one of the things you've been working on is a consortium for band called Embrace the Journey. Um, I'm really curious about what that concept is and how people can get involved with that. Well, it really started because of the whole quarantine thing in the first place that, you know, we really don't have as much of a way to connect with each other. So it really spawned out of the idea of how can I create something that we can all be a part of, right? We see these consortiums and things starting, but Oftentimes what I think is missing is where's the real connection with the composer. We see the, the composer start a consortium. It's like, it's going to be great. It's going to be a great piece. And then the piece is put out. Um, but then, well, what about the journey with the composer? So that's really what I'm trying to do here. And then I'll send out like weekly videos on how, how is the piece going and things like what, like compositional topics, orchestration, uh, form, development, those types of things. And those things will be incorporated in the whole uh, consortium thing. So it's, it's, to me, it's, it's about what can I bring to this consortium that's a little bit different than what we've seen before. Definitely, I really love that. One of, one of the things that's really important to me, um, both being a, a classroom teacher and also a conductor is, is kind of bringing in those sorts of things that we might not necessarily normally learn in the classroom. Like how does a composer get from start to finish really right. and truly as it's happening? So that's really cool that people will have the opportunity to see a little bit of that. Right, and, and you know, there's also, there's just so many more things that go into writing a piece of music than just entering the notes. A lot of people think, oh, we just enter the notes into the computer. That's, that's, that's only one of the skills. There's, I mean, of course, you have to be a great business person. You have to be just a great person in general. That's just a musician as well. But um, a lot of people don't think about this in terms of a composer. It's just like, I'm just going to write good music and I'm going to put my stuff out there. But really, there's, and you have to be a great engraver. Uh, you, there's just so many things about it that, are, that people don't necessarily think of off the top of their head. And I think it'll be great to shed light on some of those different things. Absolutely, for sure. So kind of going backwards a little bit, what kind of got you into composing and into really music in general? Where, where did that start for you? Well, it started in fourth grade. I was at some, some kind of outdoor marching band thing. And I, just, for whatever reason, didn't decide to play an instrument. And I was looking around at all these kids playing instruments and I knew something just didn't feel right. I was like, how come all these kids get to do this and I don't? So I eventually got enrolled in, in band and everything. And, and just, I just love music. And I, I picked it up really quickly and just learned all the different things. But it wasn't until around sixth grade that I started writing for whatever the reason in my head, I was like, gee, well, how do people put down all these notes on the page? And so I think I opened up a Microsoft Word document and tried to draw the lines out. And I was like, <laughs> well, clearly this isn't how they do it. <laughs> so I did some research and found, okay, so there's this thing called notation software. And of course, the first thing I download is MuseScore. And that's, that's really how 
I got started with notation software. So it was, and it just happened all because of the thought of, well, gee, how do people actually put this stuff down? Um, I, I just don't think that that's something that most people ordinarily think of. And so that's how it's, how I got started actually with the notation. And I was always interested in how, in all the comp the complexities of the score, even from, from sixth grade, looking at a grade one piece, like I was always online. Like I would bring, like when I would go to summer camps, I would bring scores on the bus and, and look at this instead of reading, you know, read, read the scores. And, and um, it was always so exciting to, to look at how other composers did things. And I would try to imitate those things. And that's really awesome. Yeah. So from there you went, through high school and into college now at the University of Maryland. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences that you've had so far and, and some of the things that you've been able to get out of that? Well, journey through high school was a, a quite, uh, it, it was really helpful in getting to college and just being able to bounce ideas off my band director and um, some of the other uh, students and, and directors there as well was really great. and. I also uh, happened to get in touch with somebody who um, has been very pivotal in my career. Uh, Brian Balmage is uh, my middle school band director. Ended up sending some of my things to him, and like just just sending them, and maybe I could get some feedback or something. And so uh, the first piece he ended up looking at was Contraption, and so we looked at that, and he got back to me, and we started. Um, started moving forward with that. And next thing I knew it was, it was published. And as a high schooler, that was always one of my goals was to be, gee, how do I become published? And so it was really, really great that that ended up landing in, uh, in my lap in high school. That's really great. That's amazing. So moving from there, what kind of led you from high school going into University of Maryland? And what, what are some of the things that you've gotten to do there um, that have kind of helped, helped you grow as a musician yeah. composer? Well, going into the University of Maryland, it was, I, I always, just for whatever reason, I knew that music was where, where I wanted to be. We all feel something about music that is just different. We just know that that's what we want to do. And so, uh, long story short, I, I wound up at the University of Maryland. I really liked Dr. Gibson, who I study with. And um, some of the things that, that we do there is really just of course the lessons and getting our chance to hear our music by really um, high quality professional musicians groups that come through every year. Those are some of the greatest things that, um, that, that happen every year. You know, it, composition lessons are, are just not, it's not like an instrumental lesson. It's very much, I, I almost would say it's a cross between an instrumental lesson and a therapy session because really what the composer, <laughs> the, the teacher is trying to do is get inside your brain and find what are the blocks that are preventing you from writing further and getting rid of those things so that you can then just let your inspiration uh, flow freely. So those are some of the great things about, um, about me studying with Gibson and uh, at, at the University of Maryland. That's really great. I love that. So going through all of those experiences um, from starting writing in sixth grade and, and going through high school and, and through your first few years in college. Um, I know for me growing up, there are always those kind of influences of just like things that I listen to or composers that I look up to and that sort of thing. What are some of those influences that have maybe helped shape some of your, co your own compositional style? Well, you know, when I was younger, um, it was a lot my my scope of music was very very limited in like sixth grade like I was listening to some pop stuff and I was also listening to but mostly I was I was listening to uh the band music that I was playing in school and so those were my models for for composition and of course it's great music but it's it's just it's a small scope of music and um as I started to to expand uh, my models from from just um, the, the music I was playing in school, I started to look at, at composers like Granger, um, composers like Holst. And, and those have been some really, really big influences on, on my compositional style today. Like some of, one of, something I really love about Granger is just how uh, just incredibly detailed he is with his scores. I mean, if you look at some of those scores, it's like, why did he add this instrument in for this tiny period of time right here in just that little, I mean, it could go on and on and on. It's just, um, it's just amazing the level of nuance and detail there is in that. And I really try to emulate that um, and, and find new ways of doing that in my scores. That's great. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting, too, to see um, 
you know, different composers going at it from so many different areas of specialty like that, where, where, you know, some people will really start out with just how does it sound, whereas other people really think about like, how exactly is this going to look and, and why is this detail included? And, and both of those are so important to, to the final product, which is really great. So as, as you're going from uh, in your band classes and learning to write from what you're playing and what you're hearing and that sort of thing, what led you to start writing things for choir? I know this is kind of a, a relatively new area for you in terms of composing, is that right? I would, I would agree. And it, it's just, I'm, I'm just thinking, why don't I try something new? Why don't I do something that, um, that I don't ordinarily do? And that often just, new, new inspiration comes from doing things that you haven't done before. And I've also found that the, that the ideas that I have manifest differently in different types of pieces or for, for diff pieces for different ensembles. The piece Awaken for choir, um, I also recently did a version for band. And I, I, the band version's okay, but I, it, it just, it works so well for choir that when you take it to band, you have to do some things to make it um, feel a little bit more fleshed out. It doesn't just translate directly. Sure, um, And right. so I, I, I really enjoyed writing for choir and I feel like it inspires different ideas and it, it really opens up your musical palette to um, look into another genre or a different um, ensemble type. Sure. Yeah. And, and so if I remember right, this is Awaken is your second piece that you've written for choir. Is that right? right? So what sorts of things did you learn from the first experience with, with writing for choir uh, that you maybe took into working with Awaken? Well, I learned that it might be nice to have words. <laughs> and I also just, the first piece had a lot of jumps in it, a lot of crazy leaps. Okay. But instrumentalists would usually have no, no problem. And not that choir people would have a problem doing it, but it's just, um, what's, what's idiomatic writing for the voice? Right. The other piece had, had good voicing, but you know, what really makes sense in terms of ranges? What ranges sound good? And um, a lot of things that composers learn, especially as we become more advanced is okay well so this instrument has this register and not just what is the reg what registers sound good and what's louder and what's softer but how am i going to use this specific register to achieve a specific sound right and so a lower register in a voice you might use to create a deeper and darker sound where in a higher register and in a bass might create a more um more intense sound and it could sing the same note as a soprano but a soprano is going to sound so much lighter and and, and just it's not going to have, it could still have intensity, but it's not going to have the same timbre and, and sound quality to it. So I think that all these different uh, compositional things start to, to work themselves in as you get deeper into it. Definitely, definitely. I know we've, we've gotten to read a little bit and some of our audience has gotten to read some of this too. Um, with the first virtual video we released for, for Awaken, um, as we kind of started getting into a lot of the conversations on race and, and politics and things like that that have been happening recently. Could you talk a little bit just, you know, about the context of Awaken? I know it necessarily, it wasn't necessarily written for that cause to start with, um, but, you know, maybe talk about some of the inspiration that started the piece off and maybe how it's kind of morphed into or, or not morphed into other things. Right, well, so it was the template for the Make Music um, contest this year and so they put out the the poem uh on the road to the contagious hospital that by william carlos williams so i was like okay this is the poem poem i'm going to do and that was the inspiration to start the piece and it's about the road to the the contagious hospital um the flowers are dead and, and through through all that process that ev everything begins to start to um awaken and, and have more life flown into it. And the piece also starts to breathe more life into it as it goes on. I think the same thing could be said in, in our world, right? We're starting to see more of the injustices that are happening. We're starting to awaken to, to what's happening in our world. And we're going to do our best to, to, to bring justice to everything that's, that's going on right now. That's what it means to me in the context of, of the current situation that way. Awesome. Yeah, that's really great. So Luke, one of Luke's responses to the COVID-19 crisis obviously has been um, the Songs from Home series that we're a part of right now. Um, but I know you also have worked on some of your own projects as a response to the situation, including both the consortium and some other projects as well. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Another project um, that I've been asked to work on is um, uh, a wonderful group of directors in Minnesota has put out 
a, um, a, a consortium for, for black American composers. I was fortunate to be selected as, as one of the composers for that. They've given us the opportunity to possibly reflect on, um, on the black Ameri American experience in the, the United States. And so well, what I've chosen to do is I, I didn't do that exactly. I, I took a different approach. I'm like, how can I uplift my community? And so what I've done is I've taken inspiration from um, a, a famous inventor um, who may not be well known to everybody, but certainly is an instrumental part in, in a lot of things, Louis Latimer. And he did a lot of work on the light bulb uh, with, with Thomas Edison. Everybody knows Thomas Edison. And I'm sure many people know Louis Latimer, but I just don't think his name is quite as big as, as he deserves. And so just before this interview was working on the piece, um, it's called Incandescence. It just kind of celebrates the life of Louis Latimer and, and um, his contributions and his ingenuity in, um, in, in his work on the, on the light bulb, among other things. Yeah, a, a lot of these different projects like these are, are kind of popping up, and it's really nice to see the really different and unique ways that people are going about things like that. Um, so it's really interesting to see how you've kind of taken your prompt and kind of spun it in a way that works best for you. So that's really cool. On a completely different note, one of the things that we like to do a lot when we interview our singers or other musicians or composers or whoever is we ask really just kind of weird off the wall questions. So my question for you is dinosaurs or puppies and why? No context, just choose one of the two. Well, see, it's, it's hard <laughs> um, because, well, I have a dog, so I love puppies. Right. I don't have a dinosaur, but I think if I could, I, I probably would pick dinosaurs because if, I, if, if that means I could see a dinosaur, I would take it. That's fair. That's a totally fair choice. I think the first time I was asked that, I think my first reaction was dinosaurs too. Um, cool. It doesn't eat me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Maybe we'll go with a, a herbivore and then we'll be okay. Um, so as we're kind of closing out things, um, what do you have any sort of advice for other aspiring and upcoming composers or conductors, singers, other musicians? The first best piece of advice I could give is just be, just be yourself. Because th there's so many people out here that are trying to be the best at this and the best at that. And maybe not necessarily being the most genuine to themselves. And, and that's, that's not what that's not what's going to attract attention to you. you you have to be who you are right whatever your personality is whatever that is you just you have to be you i would say the second piece of advice i would give is find a mentor or, or mentors find find people that are doing what you're doing that you're like i want to do what they're doing and, and and connect with them that's just about the most invaluable resource that you can find is somebody who will work with you to, be, to help you become the, the best at what you do, uh, to, to become as good at what you do as, uh, as you possibly can. Yeah, and I, I can absolutely echo both of those sentiments. And they almost kind of come hand in hand too, because the, the moment that you start letting yourself be who you are is also the moment that you start running into circles of people who are just like you, who want to do exactly. the same things that you want to do. Exactly. One, of, one of the most encouraging things that I've seen as you, know, you and I are, are a very similar age and, and going through... Um, similar kind of parts of our careers. Uh, but one of the most encouraging things that I've seen is, you know, the, the people who are in this, this very kind of niche field, they all want to see everyone succeed. And they want to help, especially the younger or, or more novice uh, people in whatever field you're in, they want to see us succeed. Um, and they want to see the, the new innovations that are going to come from that. I think um, we're so lucky to have that. And I think it's part of the reason why it's such a great community um, to, to be in because of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know one of the, the first things, first moments that I knew that I was going to go into music was at uh, Maryland's Allstate Choir. And, and just that weekend of being surrounded by people who are also really great musicians who are kind of obsessed with, with this thing of making sound with your face. Um, made me realize, oh, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. I have to do this. <laughs> it's a calling. It's just, you know, you're supposed to be in music. You know that. Just... Absolutely. Well, I know we've had a lot of different topics here and kind of bounced around a bit. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to discuss that maybe we haven't talked about or anything like that? Back to becoming, um, you know, as good of a, a conductor and a composer as, as you can be, as I would say that all these things, they, they really go hand in hand. And just someone who, who wants to be a great 
um, anything, any one of these things, I would say to develop as many skills as you can and just do as much as you can. If you want to be a great conductor, also uh, don't let that take away from being a great performer. If you want to be a great performer, don't give up the chance to learn how to conduct because all these things influence each other and they all just really, really help you to, to, to become the most well-rounded and best musician and person that, that you can be. So, uh, so I would def just do as much as you can. Absolutely. Well, Adrian, thank you so much for joining us and, and talking with us a little about your life and your piece. Um, we're really excited to share a remastered video and recording on YouTube as part of the Songs from Home series. Thank you so much, Robbie. Absolutely. And for those of you who are watching, be sure to watch our video for Awaken uh, and check out some of our other videos and interviews as part of the Songs from Home series. If you'd like to learn more about Luke's and what we're up to, you can check us out at choirlukes.com. If you'd like to find out more about some of Adrian's work and his consortiums and projects, you can check him out at adrianbsims.com. Uh, so Adrian, thank you again so much for joining me and for giving us your time today. Thank you. This has been great.